Hello, good, every, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for waiting. Um, and <laughs> it's Saturday and it's the weekend from Christmas. So we really, really do appreciate you being here. So I've got a fantastic guest this evening. I'm really excited about um, her story. Uh, so Keely, she is an experienced and qualified psychotherapist and owner for Key for Change. Um, she is an author, coach and supervisor with a special interest in intimate relationships and human potential. So Keely has dedicated herself to her profession after she picked up her, her first self-help book when she was a single mother working on IKEA's checkout in 1998. Wow. Um, at that time, Keely was madly in love with a narcissistic man and that roller coaster of an experience has inspired her career. Uh, today, as bizarre as it may seem, Keely is grateful for that time. Keely faced her fears and it changed her life for the better and ultimately enabled her to help other people to find victory in adverse circumstances. Keely now has a private clinic in West End and offices in Baker Street and supports a host of international clients online. Keely regards herself, herself as a contemporary psychotherapist with traditional underpinnings. A working class background informs her thinking and people seek her out uh, for her straight talking, no nonsense style. Um, so, and you can find out more information um, at uh, keyforchain.com and we'll get to that in the end as well. Um, so Keely, I am really, really excited to have you on this call with us. Um, so first of all, you know, there's so much to your amazing story. It's almost like that zero to hero. You really took control of your life, how you ended up in Ikea and then being, a, um, so I really want to explore that deeply, how that happened. And, and secondly as well, about narcissism um, I know that's such a huge deal uh, being in the COVID environment a lot of people are locked indoors you know some could be stuck with narcissistic partners and um, so I'm very very interested um, in you know how how you got out of that and how how we can help women in the same situation but yeah do tell us a, li a little bit more about yourself because it's fascinating that you're now in this amazing West End and Baker Street offices so Hmm. So I guess my journey is it's, it's all very easy when you're um, at this particular point. The, you know, it all becomes, well, it doesn't become a blur to me, but the reality is it's taken time and it's taken sacrifice and it's taken faith and it's taken spiritual principles to radically change my life. And I think one of the problems of, the, of our time in this instant gratification society that we live in, where we can hit a button and Uber Eats are at our house, hit a button and you can watch the whole series of a popular show because no one wants to wait the week anymore. Yeah, Everybody wants things on demand. And so the real challenge with that is that change takes time. True, authentic, let's deal with the root cause takes time and it doesn't happen at breakneck speed which people find very difficult because they want change yesterday the challenge with true authentic change is if we actually look at our attachment style our attachment patterns how we were raised how we weren't loved as kids that informs how we are unconsciously and shows up most acutely and often most painfully in our intimate relationships. That's my story. And it's the story of many others that our stuff shows up acutely in our intimate relationships. Where for myself personally, I was a highly empathic person, caring person, you always have culture about that. My mother's a black Jamaican woman who brought me up in a way where it's about being, you know, being kind, being good, putting men first in a kind of servitudinal role. Um, and I also watched mum being abused too. So that then becomes your own template. Although verbally you're like, that ain't happening to me, that ain't happening to me. The reality is unconsciously your brain, your neural pathways have been shaped mm -hmm. by those experiences. And by the time you reach adulthood, you have a whole repertoire of skill sets that enable you to stay in unhealthy dynamics. So for me, my kind of personal journey was about falling in love with a gentleman who was here from Jamaica, 
needed to get his stay and all of those dramas and then he had the wife who was the wife to get the stay then they tell you another story so you've got you've got layers of story here so you've got politics you've got history you've got colonialism you've got prejudice you've got the the, the caribbean you know the african diaspora so um that relationship became one way and i was in a position where i was desperate to be loved desperate to be valued because I didn't have such a healthy relationship with my father growing up. Didn't feel loved. And so obviously, unconsciously, you go to remedy that pain through your intimate relationships. So by the time I had my second child, the relationship was violent. I kept going back, baffled why I kept going back. And in the end, it resulted where I'd taken out a loan on finance. Big up to all the people, the ladies, because we do it, who take finance out for our men because this happens to us especially if we think we've got someone who's got potential this is why I got a thing if you think you've fallen in love with a potential sister hold on hold on because sometimes we trying to le- elevate some lead weight that's true <laughs> yes yes we're trying to elevate lead weight you see me now me see I see man with potential now I said lovely Come back to me when you're finished nurturing your dreams and your ideas, because the last one, I spent my whole time nurturing his dreams, his ideas. He took me credit, messed up me credit, and I was left with the kids. Yeah. So for, uh, for many of us women, we have this, as uh, well, from the Caribbean diaspora, this thing about wanting to help and feeling like we have to give abundantly to our men to prove that we're the good woman. Yeah. And, you know, as time as I've shifted away from that, men tend to have issues, you know, the types I used to go before will have issue with that. And I found that difficult myself to surrender that part of me, that savior part of me, because it also feeds our ego at some level. You know, you want them to think of you as being the woman like, oh, she turned my life. It wouldn't know where I'd be without you. We get all like fanciful in our thinking. Yet the next thing you know, he's got some next chick driving around in the car that is actually in your name. And when they make a late payment, you're paying for it. The ultimate insult. And you have their kids. And then they're ready, they'll phone you and cuss you and tell you you're not, you're not, you're not going to stop them from seeing their kids. It's a recipe for mayhem. So I think that real... At, at kind of 18, 19, kind of getting myself into that and finding it very difficult to get out of. My saving grace was watching Oprah one day when the Jan Levansant came on. Every sister need a lick of Jan Levansant in her. Listen, if you ain't got in your bookshelves, histories, come on now. Yep. Be it value in the valley in the meantime. Like, but like it was the best place possible for me to start. And it was for me, I remember being pregnant with my second child and realizing that that was about the only place I found solace in self-help books because everybody else was like, oh, we told you so, we could see it was a nightmare. Yet with those narcissistic traits, it was epic highs followed by tremendous lows. And like I say to many of my clients who seek me out because I'm, I'm familiar, you know, I'm over about the fact that I support people with narcissists, Unless you've been in it, people don't get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. People yeah. think you're the Looney Tune. Yeah. And you can end up trying to explain to people your situation or the small ways that they're driving you insane, but they don't really get it. You, it's almost like you have to walk it. You, you, you have to get embroiled in it because it's psychological warfare, spiritual warfare as well, if you want to kind of consider it from that viewpoint, if you are that way inclined. So my, my saving grace was in the meantime. It was a book. I was living in St. Ralph's. I was an estate girl. Like, I ain't going to no therapy. That's some white people thing. I ain't got no, I couldn't imagine paying 40 van to someone to sit to chat to them for an hour. That to me seemed to berserk. But I could afford a book. A book made sense to me. So I remember I went to Waterstones Harrow and it was $7.99 and I read it. Read it in the bath and it just made sense. It made utter sense to me and it spoke to me. And after that book I bought yesterday, I cried. And in yesterday I cried, she spoke about going back to university to study law, to you know equip herself to change her career. And that moved me. 
I never, I never left school with any qualifications, GCSEs or anything. I, I wasn't dumb, but school didn't bring out my genius, let's say. Yeah. And I think, let's be honest, most state schools are off. It felt like my state school was housing us basically, or prepping us to be the next customer service agents or to work in the council. And in my state, working for the council was like the mecca. You made it if you had a good council job with a good pension, right? So I, I decided that I liked psychology. I baffled myself. It baffled me that I kept going back, that I had so much to say and run my mat, yet if we call, you know, next thing you know, you're back in bed with them ladies. Let's have it. Sometimes the lady flower is controlling the thing. Give me a like, give me a like if you know what I'm talking about. Because if you look, we're live right here. I know I'd have you lot in fits of laughter. <laughs> Sometimes our sexual needs causes us to compromise ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> So everyone, this is a quite discussional. So feel free to jump in and ask her questions. We want this as live because she's such an amazing woman. I'm loving this. <laughs> well, you know what, my sister, people love it because they're like, oh my God, Key, that is me. You're real. And that's the reality. You know, I can use humor. I can intermingle um, my own experiences in a way, which is a blessed thing that I can laugh at myself now. Because before, listen, I weren't tears of laughter. It was tears of bewilderment, pain, sorrow. I was just baffled. So basically that took me to the point where I decided to go back to university. And um, I, well, firstly I did an access course and an access course was the one year course that prepares you for university to see if you've got the grade. Did that, got in and decided to do psychology because I baffled me. And I really wanted to understand like, how do I keep like, wow, like who, who else goes through this? And I wanted to help other people like me as well. And I think at that time, um, you know, uh, you know, if you're from the Caribbean culture, you'll understand the term gyalis. You'll, you know, you'll, we also understand the term womanizer. So the individual I was, he, he womanizes. So that's what he does. If it ain't you, it'd be another chick, you know? So, and if they leave children in their wake, they leave children in their wake. It's, it's what they do. So, Studying psychology, I got to Brunel, I did a four year degree, a sandwich degree. And I did the four year degree because I wanted to get work experience because I had none. I was at Ikea checkout. My, my main thing was telling people, excuse me, can you leave the yellow bag behind, please? Like, that's <laughs> me. You know what I'm saying? Like, can you buy, yeah. No, you need to buy a blue one, please. That's 25. Yes, thank you. That, that was my duty, um, as well as eating all their little dime bars. And so, <laughs> You know, what came from that was I kind of had a desire for better, but I didn't know what that would look like. IKEA was a place that many women were also from social housing projects and ended up staying. It just was a thing that you just ended up staying. Never, never meant to, but it happened to a lot of people. And I was, and I noticed that the Asian people, always the Asian people, because I started there when I was at college, they always went back to college when September came tended to be the black kids who would end up starting to work longer hours, getting a car on tick. Next thing you know, we don't go back. And I was one of those, I got pregnant. So doing my degree, because I had the sandwich, it meant that I had to do work placement. My second work place was at Wormwood Scrubs Prison. And that really fascinated me. Plus I was a good girl and I liked a bad boy. You know what I'm saying, sister? <laughs> that should be in the DSM-5. You ain't got depression, sister. That's not called depression. That's called good girl, bad boy complex. And until you <laughs> overcome that, you're going to be depressed. <laughs> That's the real issue. Too many people going around saying I'm anxious and I'm depressed. I'm like, show me your life and I'll show you what you're doing that is screwing you up. And people miss that. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges I have right now is that people are quick to label themselves as depressed and anxious, yet take no responsibility for what the hell they're doing in their lives. Like if you don't block people, yeah, mm -hmm. that in itself is good for your mental health. Yeah. Block and delete. Elizabeth, I'm a lion sister. 
You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Some of them people, they're just not good for your spirit. Okay, then. Yes, yes. Some of these people are not good for us. Yeah. They're full of challenge. They're manipulative. We find it very difficult to say no to them. Block people. It's a way to save your sanity. I 100% agree, you know, you know, as a, you know I'm a fellow empath and that for me, I only started doing this year, mm -hmm. um, all my life, I've, it's just been hard for me and it's something you mentioned earlier about that savior mentality, it's like they can't do without me and just <sighs> say, saying no, like I find it so hard, especially like if it's family or something, you just feel the guilt as well, so but we'll get onto that, I'll let you finish your story. Well you're absolutely right and 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 that's why you know I some people are just very difficult to say no to especially once you start to get into family it's a whole nother level of challenge mm. um blocking off you know like I teach my clients like sometimes it's better to text people so you don't have that two blue two blue tick anxiety they're online offline they go back <laughs> oh my god oh they don't they change the whatsapp picture oh my god who's that easy he with he's looking really like let's save ourselves that mayhem text save your sunny these are ways that we can begin to protect ourselves so for me degree finished my degree got my degree and then got my first job back in the prison in the prison as a probation well firstly it was a drug and alcohol worker so that then really got me in but like i said again the challenge is being the good girl working in with bad boys it was a very interesting place to end up working in prison with people from my community and to really begin to apply what I was understanding from psychology and sociology in a very real life way. Like prison is a very profound place to understand the human spirit, but also it does something to you working in those jobs. It does something to you as an empathic person. It does something to you as well as just like you spoke about empaths getting a fix, getting a need met by being, by being valued and having people come to us. When you work in a prison, you're valued because you are a, have a currency and a value to an offender. So you're desired and you're wanted and you're regarded. And if you don't keep a check on that, it's very easy for your boundaries to slip. Very easy because it's ego feeding. It's feeding your ego for validation. And if your attachment style is one where you weren't valued by your parents, by growing up and feeling of value and worth, then that starts to play out again. This is why I'm a massive fan of self-awareness. Obviously being highly empathic in those industries, you have to be careful. You end up making people's problems your own. People don't do it to you. You have to ask people, what help do you need? Because for so many of us, we see people's problem and we swoop in with, with, with the S on with chess and we're finding all manner of solutions. Yet when Mr. Man was making his problems, we were nowhere to be seen. Yeah. These are the, these are the ways we set ourselves up. And so I am really much about helping empaths to check their ego. How can you get your stroke without constantly putting yourself in vulnerable positions where people are draining you and leeching from you? It's your, it's your responsibility. And obviously if codependency comes in, well then you, you've got a mayhem of a relationship. You, you just, it's, it's just mayhem because both are, you know, you're feeding each other. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, I think codependency I think coercive, one of the challenges for myself is coercive relationships because I'm a, I'm a big practitioner, a pra, you know, I push that we make choices for ourselves, yet with coercive relationships, that individual is almost controlled by somebody else. Someone else is in the driving seat, really. They make choices for you. So coercive relationships are very, very difficult. Yeah. And there is a way you, you, you have to be able to work, I believe, in teams with that person, teams. So basically, I got into the system. I got into probation. I was working for probation. I worked with, I delivered programs. That's why I'm so expressive. So I delivered offender behavior programs, thinking skills, TSP, anger management, the sex offender program. And it feels like if you can, you know, New York, New York, if you can make it there, it's a prison, but like you can make it anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> 
trust me, you can make it anywhere. And, and humor was one of the things that I always used to connect with people. And I think because majority of the psychologists I worked with were not from a working class background, I had that ad advantage that I could connect with people through language, style, song, in ways that really spoke to, you know, these are people I go on the wing, they'll be like, all right, Key, how's your mum? They'll be like, bruv, hold it down, innit? You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, hold it down. So um, I think that was of, of great benefit to me. However, I could quite quickly see the longer I was in the system, I'd become systematized, you know? Mm -hmm. I also noticed that in the system, they tended to promote black Christian women. They really like to promote Christian women. And if you kind of don't fit that mold, you're on the outside. And that's how I kind of felt. But at the same time, what I chose to do, because I didn't want to become a psychologist, plus I wasn't, you know, I didn't get the grade to become a psychologist. I chose to do psychotherapy and I chose to self-fund my master's. And if I wanted to have become a psychologist, the prison would have funded my, my master's. And obviously, if you have a government funded master's, the government are going to fund the areas of psychology that they want you to understand. Mm, so they have the control. <laughs> there you go. So I believe it's often a reductionist model or that's why CBT is so much, you know, pushed and promoted. And that didn't speak to me because CBT didn't take into context the class, race, the individual experiences that shape who they are. So I studied person-centered psychotherapy at the Metanoia Institute in Elin, and it was costly. And one of the benefits of going for a costly course at a reputable institute was actually it got me access to middle-class people. And I felt deeply inadequate um, because I felt like I snuck in the back door. You know, um, these were people I'd probably be serving at Ikea, not sitting, being with on par. So I, I really struggled with that, yet I knew I needed to be there. And I met, you know, and it, and it helps, it's helped to ground me in no, no, no end. When I finished my qualification in 2012, I was still working part-time and I just knew that with my authenticity that had developed from 2008 through training, that I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna bode well in a traditional job. I could see that even in probation, I couldn't really work up. I was constantly, you know, that glass ceiling, yet I was probably more qualified then my peers being that I'd also self-funded. So in the end, uh, and I think what was helpful about being around middle-class people was that they did not think twice about opening up their own practice and having a business of themselves. It, 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 it weren't a big deal. So that exposure meant that my own aspirations moved up. Mm -hmm. And at 2012, I started the business. 2015, I left the prison. And today I have Key for Change, where all manner of people come to me for life, man problem, woman problem, life dilemmas. Sometimes it's traditional therapy. Sometimes it's like people need to run, I need to run a problem by you. Some people, you, it's therapy, but you can't tell them it's therapy. So you can tell them it's coaching because they, man, man, a man don't do therapy, you know, key, but I need to chat to you still. So I kind of like get it, you know? <laughs> yeah. I don't do therapy, you know. Can you coach me? I'll be like, yeah, you're going to have therapy, but fine. We call it coaching. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever works. You know, I, I help people in ways that um, are far from non far from traditional but the outcome is to be sensitive to people's needs and work with them in ways that work for them, but also that work, you know, work for me. And I think the more that I'm in private practice is the more I see, I kind of see from a very bigger picture what the issue is with people, why there is this perpetual rise in, in what they call mental health problems. Um, and I think people ultimately seek me out because I'm different. They're like, I heard you're different. I heard you're real. I heard you say it like it is, man. I heard you get it, you know. And I'm and I'm very fortunate that that people do and that my authenticity that I battled with, I try to, you know, make myself conform. And, you know, I tried to do the little pearl earrings and the monsoon flurry frocks. And my tutors were like, Key, this ain't you, man. This this ain't you. And, you know, I'm really grateful that 
I've remained and I'm encouraged to remain true to myself and ultimately walked by faith because I had to, because I couldn't see how it would work out. But little by little, you know, <laughs> little by little by his grace. And that's another thing, you know, mental health has no space for spirituality. You imagine? And, and as black people, we have spiritual underpinnings, man. You know, so, you know, you start talking too much about that when you go for your, you see what I'm saying, Lizzie? Yeah. You know that Lizzie thumbs up scene? Boom, yeah. bam. Yeah. yeah. You go, you go to your psychiatrist, you start, you, you start telling them that you've been talking to God, you better mind. <laughs> <Hey>! <laughs> I do that online. <laughs> see? Yeah. So we must be mindful. We mm. must be mindful of the power dominant group. And, and, you know, it, that's, that's their choice, right? That they, they see things from their lens. And I believe, you know, well, I'm not trying to move up that scale because I just find it too painful. You know, being rejected, told you, you didn't get the job again because Sarah got it. And they give you a long-winded excuse and a list of feedback. And then you've got to try and you just like, I don't, I can't do it to myself no more. Me and God, me and Jah, Buddha, Allah, whoever you are, call him, the spirit, the force. Like, I'd rather try and battle it out day by day here rather than have to concede, adapt, make myself small, you know, not wear me cap and my little collar collar jacket. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, Amazing. I, just, I love it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's where I'm at. So there you go. Any questions, comments? I'll be glad to answer them. Yeah, guys, Otherwise, come on, don't chat. be shy. Just, I'll, just keep going. I'll just keep going. If you're shy, you can put it in the, co um, the comments, the chat mm -hmm. box below. Um, but I really, um, so you mentioned one of your key turnarounds was the book you read. And um, mm -hmm. I did read in your bio, you are an author as well. Can you mm -hmm. tell us about your book and, and why you wrote it up, sis? Well, to be honest, I'm no by no way, by, by no way means um, a, 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 nat a natural writer in any way, shape or form fundamentally probably because I didn't have the educational grounding to be a writer and I think if I chose to now I'd be very good at it you know it's something that I kind of think about you know going back to the basics to learn the fundamentals I still can't work out a semicolon from a full stop and a comma it still gets to me yeah I felt that in terms of like marketing myself it would be helpful to have different ways that people can have access to me because I'm very much aware of the stigma with regards to what I do. And, uh, you know, when people think, think about come to work with me, it can be quite a significant investment. So it's like, how can I help people make smaller investments to the point where they're like, okay, that makes sense. And I felt that, you know, as someone who went from calamity to calamity in my intimate relationships, I, the, uh, my, my book is called Why Love Hurts. And it's such a beautiful name because I just was baffled, you know, I'd been baffled about why loving like they do. Celine Dion tells us in the songs, and it? You love and you give it your all and power ballad songs. Yet I always ended up with egg on my face, you know? Mm. So that was my ambition. But ultimately it really is about, you know, basically empathic people mm. and our incessant desire and perpetually pulling narcissistic individuals to us. Because I'm not about, you know, I've evolved. Where I was isn't where I am. I'm not about, oh, poor empaths, poor empaths. I'm a bit like, empaths, you need to wake up. <laughs> Fix up yourself, <laughs> you know? That's my way. I'm like, we got to wake up because people will target us for that nature, for their own ends. Absolutely. Hi. Lizzie, my friend. <laughs> yes, Keely. Wow. I'm so glad I tuned in. Oh, I'm blessings. so glad I tuned in. You've cheered me up. And uh, yeah, I can see myself reflected in you, even though I'm from the other side of the world, um, born in Uganda, born in East mm. Africa. But everything you're saying is just universal for mm. us Black women. It is, uh, yeah. And whatever light that you can shed, you know, through your own personal experience, and then we go out there and we, we spread the word, then hopefully there'll be fewer, fewer of us that have to go through this. And we have to bring up our daughters and our boys, particularly the boys, to understand, you know, the, the impact of what this kind of behavior can have 
on 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 innocent bystanders. I mean, I always yeah. feel as though you know, without going too much into personal history right now, but it's always as though you know you were innocently standing around making uh, minding your own business almost. And you got taken into something that you were like totally, you didn't see the signs, you didn't see the, you didn't get the memo, you didn't, you know, you were looking the other way when it was all happening. And yet we could rationalize, I could rationalize and, um, and say, okay, like, you know, falling in love with potential. I can see that this guy has it. And I'm sure that if I stick around long enough and nurture him and be there, and you know, I'm going to be his queen. I'm going to be the power behind the throne. I'm going to be the one that got him there. And, <laughs> but <laughs> but the, the, the odd thing for me, um, if I may quickly not take up too much of your time, but to say that, I mean, I grew up in a family that was very loving, had a very good relationship with my, my father. My parents were married for over 50 years you know, good solid people, you know, church going, very community minded and all the rest of it. Seven brothers and sisters, same mother, same father. Uh, he educated all of us to master's level. And, um, and so I'm always asking myself where, what happened? Why, it, I never felt unloved, but I did feel that I couldn't quite reach those very high standards that my my father set for me. I was brought up to believe you can do anything, you can. I'm an independence baby, and I, that's what I put it down to. Uh, born in the 60s and, you know, being told you can do anything, be anything. But in his mind, that meant always getting A's. Okay. Yeah. So when... You know, when you get the school report saying could have done better or could do better, it was that, it was almost as if I got all E's. Mm. You know, I was getting the A's, I was, but then don't you dare get a B either. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it, I, I'm yeah. still trying to work it out in my mind. Well, I, I think, I think what, you know, I'm very fortunate that, you know, my journey has taken me to work with people from across the spectrum. And I think one of the challenges you're talking about is the challenges of, of high achievers. And I think high achievers, perfectionists don't really get the space to talk about the shadow side of high achievement and for perfectionism, which is a very damning harsh inner critic in your head, you know, and you're particularly relentless and awful with yourself. And on one of my programs, which is Pain Into Purpose, my ambition is we talk about that voice. We wanna befriend that voice because it's often the internalized voice of the hypercritical parent. And it's done from back then, then and there, in order to protect you from the chastisement of your parents. But actually in our adult life, it no longer serves us. Yeah. yeah. And, and high achievers also have the other problem, which is an education system that values uh, the logical side of your brain. So if you are creative, the, edu the mainstream education system diminishes creativity. So you can sometimes have a child who is naturally creative, who has to suppress, ignore, bury that part of themselves and it ends up, even though they may achieve, but they've become highly disconnected from their authentic self. My That's ambition as a therapist is you help people to integrate. Yeah. That Thank you very much. Good. Thank you very much for that because it's only now in my 60s that I've started painting, drawing. These are all the subjects that I had given up when my father told me you have to take mm -hmm. French. French is a marketable subject. You're yeah. going to do law. So drop this, drop that. Yes. Anyway, the, the other thing I wanted to quickly mention was uh, when you talked about coercive relationships. Um, to give Theresa May her credit, uh, one of the things that she did whilst she was prime minister was to make it part of the domestic abuse agenda to say Indeed. that coercive relationships are just as harmful as anything that is uh, physical assault. Of course, the problem is to prove it, as with everything, that you're being coerced, whether it's financially, emotionally, psychologically, into doing things which are against your better uh, judgment. So thank you very much. I will look out for you. Key for change. 
keepachange.com find me give me a like you can find me on youtube instagram facebook blessing sister it's really beautiful to hear you speak about your creative side i was so grateful yeah. to hear that it's yeah really got, um, all that stuff i mean it's beautiful. amazing thank you Thank you, that's Elizabeth. great thank you so much elizabeth amazing um so that's just, literally um that's been one oh do we have another question ah no okay that's that's fine um so similar to my journey elizabeth i think we're so similar and um i don't know whether this generation were I think we're in a way probably luckier because of the information out there. So we get exposure to spirituality and all these things because I was a high achiever as well. You know, I was said my dad was a medical doctor, you know, um, like um, straight A's and, and all of that. But I was always creative as a child, but I was a rebel as well. Um, and the only reason I got away with it um, was because I could maintain the grades, but I was able to, you know, play the piano and do my artwork and say no from a young age um, so I did ultimately you know quiver and and sort of go into that uh, the profession so I ended up going to the city because I thought you know that was what success was you know just earning the money and it ultimately failed because that wasn't what was in my heart and in my passion. Um, so I ended up just, you know, setting up a foundation where we would send uh, arts and music equipments to schools in Africa. And that was my way of giving back because I didn't really have that opportunity to do that. Um, and I wanted to um, the children to get uh, the opportunity to have arts and music, but more from a scientific perspective to say, you know, this can really help them not just, you know, be fun and creative, but with their brain and, and development of that prefrontal cortex and just being this whole rounded individual and more confidence as well um so i i completely get that and um i feel fortunate that things are turning around and people are becoming more aware of all these things um i don't know what you think about that keely well i think i think one of the challenges is is there are many ways to heal and you know i have my my supervisor is a dance psychotherapist my other supervisor is a drama psychotherapist so it is about how can you use the body as well, mm. you know, as well as not just sitting and talking and talking and talking. You know, there are many ways to heal the human spirit. And I think what is commonly called mental health problems is actually inauthenticity. Mm. People have become inauthentic. And the more inauthentic you are, the more mental health problems you're going to have. Because it's kind of promoted as mental health. You've got mental health problems. No, actually that mental health problem is appropriate because you're so out of alignment with your authenticity so you yeah. can expect that that is a natural outcome so it means that we need to then start to look at so what is that person doing in their life what's their behaviors mm. you know wh what are they watching on 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 the device you know who's if we went onto your youtube channel who pops up are you sitting there watching people with big breasts and big booties and feeling inadequate because you got a B? Mm. We need to pay attention to what fuels inadequacy. And I think the challenge we have is if you isolate looking at the individual, you miss the social context. Yeah. You know, class matters. It matters. You know, as someone who regards themselves as middle class-ish, I know that when I have my life challenges, I have far more options than my people from the ends who I grew up with, you know, yeah. and I'm educated, I have a profession. So I have far more choices available to me. And this, it matters and it has an impact. So, you know, I think traditional mental health kind of isolates the individual. It comes from a Eurocentric perspective. And that is very difficult for people who don't fulfill and tick those boxes. People like me will not be able to navigate that system because I don't mm -hmm. talk the language. I, I, don't, I don't talk the language and I, I don't fit. Mm -hmm. So naturally it means you end up working for yourself, which is tough, right? Because now all of a sudden you've got to be a therapist, you've got to be a marketeer, you've got to be the bin emptier, you've got to be the finance director you know secretary and but do you love all trades yeah you know but how how about this though um so before you find you know 
So that's one thing, realizing that you're disconnected from your inner authenticity, but there's that extra fear as well. Cause I know, especially for me being different, as humans, we sort of want to be social creatures and you already have this community and you know you stepping into your authentic self will distance you. So wouldn't that be added pressure as well? Like for me personally, I've been through that journey and it was hard before, but how do we help people know that it's okay not to fit in and take that brave step to being your authentic self without it impacting you know, them being alone or feeling alone Um, Well, change creates a chain reaction. The challenge is you can't avoid it, mm -hmm. which is fine. You know, to be authentic, you have to go through a process of being with oneself. And for many people, they're frightened of being with themselves. That's why they constantly distract themselves. They're fearful of themselves. So, you know, I respect that on this journey that I'm on, that people might only go so far. That's fine. Sometimes people come back. I respect that where I am now has cost me highly. I was never the school run mum. I was never the mum who's at the front row for the Christmas play because she, I was always working. I came in late and had to stand up at the back. So there's a con that, you know, with everything you do, there's always a shadow and a consequence, an unintended consequence. Mm -hmm. I've just never been that mum. And I have to learn to live with that. What was my intentions? So I think it's about a slow and steady pace. Authenticity might be someone who decides instead of buying black clothes all the time, which is what I used to do, that they might buy something that is pink. They've always looked at it in the shop, but they've always said no. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that's what I talk about in Pain Into Purpose. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the slogans I say is, you know, you can't eat a whole cow, but you can have a burger. Mm. You know, no one's sitting there, you know, and what do I mean by that? I mean, you start small. I'm not saying, you know, I wouldn't have gone from Ikea checkout girl to business owner. If you would have came to the Ikea checkouts and whispered to me in 20 years, you're going to be a psychotherapist and you're going to have your own business and you could be seeing clients all around the world. I'll be like, are you smoking crack? <laughs> yeah. I'll be like, what are you on? How the hell would that happen? <laughs> too massive, too big way beyond my comprehension but if you told me to go to waterstones in harrow and buy a book for 7.99 i could do that just by yeah. size small mm -hmm. and it gets momentum and it gathers momentum and then the next thing you know you're buying color color jacket and you don't care again <laughs> Amazing. No, that makes complete sense. And I guess this links into another point that you touched on the imposter syndrome. This is one I think so many people struggle with. And I just don't know where to begin with this one. Um, how, how does this impact on, well, on mental health? Or what do you think? What's your opinion on it? Well, some a recent book I've just read called Steal As Much As You Can by Natalie Ola talks about imposter syndrome actually being um, when people from the lower stratas enter into new circles and they don't know how to navigate those circles because they don't know the nuance. Mm. So I, I really appreciate Natalie's thoughts, which is basically saying, stop internalizing your inadequacy as a shortcoming of your own. Let's start to look at the social context that you're in that evokes your sense of not being good enough. What is, at, you know, I have a dear friend, she's a doctor, she studied at the Tavistock and she and I were talking about imposter syndrome and she was talking about, you know, when she goes in and it's an all white panel. And that's where we began talking about, well, actually maybe this is about class and you not having, because you can't deny, right? Mm. Because even if we try and speak well, we'll, mm. we'll drop the T's, our vocabulary will yeah. let them know that we are not from that background. Mm -hmm. So I think, Imposter syndrome, if we look at it from a psychological perspective, which is what most people um, consider it from as an, as an individual having an inadequacy about themselves, it's about how do you begin to validate yourself? Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But rather than seeing it as an inadequacy of yourself, I am also encouraging people to begin to see that it is also about power dominant groups and how you may feel inadequate because you don't fit. I remember when I first qualified 
obviously as a psychotherapist there's not that you know people don't tend to look like myself and it was really important that I bought a pair of Russell and Bromley shoes <laughs> <laughs> me and my supervisor used to laugh about it all the time I was like, I'm qualified, I can get myself a Russell and... Pe I had to have a pair of Russell and Bromley shoes. <laughs> and when I got my mugs, I had to make sure it said John Lewis at the bottom. So when I tipped it up, they could see it. Said John oh, <laughs> we've all been through it. <laughs> it matters. So I think, I think it's about a good enough... In isolation, it is about not being good enough complex. And I think for black women who are prone to imposter syndrome, it taps into an inferiority complex. And what often happens, and employers benefit from this profoundly, is it results in us going above and beyond. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, to prove we are worthy of this position. We mm. are good enough. And so we give, 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 which is what's so humiliating when we don't get the promotion and we are there, you know, in that same position again, feeling insulted and deflated and if you're not careful it taps into your inferiority complex mm -hmm. and you go through this continuous cycle of going above and beyond to prove your worth mm -hmm. when, always volunteering or who's going to do that or who's going to work on the weekend or who's going to do all the jobs that nobody else wants to do over and above you've got a job but you want to you're the first one to put your hand up knowing that it means that you're going to have fewer hours with your kids after work or you're going to do, and it's not paid. And it was only and therefore, when- And I tell my clients this all the time. If you think you're getting 15 pound an hour and you're supposed to do a 35 hour week, if you're doing a 40 hour week, 45 hour week, you're not getting paid 15 pound an hour, Ooh, girl. You need to divide that money by the real, you're probably not even on minimum wage now they done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, work backwards and see exactly what your worth is. And if I can just share, you know, what's helped me to get or become authentic in the end. And I love what you said about spiritual underpinnings for black women. Uh, mine came through the, the Buddhist route, through mm -hmm. mindfulness of breath. Amen. As simple as that, mindfulness of breath, coming to that point of accepting whatever I find there without judgment, with loving kindness, Amen. with curiosity, yeah. with, and see, oh, oh, so that's what I'm feeling today. Yeah. Well, that's what is there right now. And being at home with it and just accepting it and being aware of that inner critic and, you know, speaking kindly to myself as I would to any other friend who was hurting. We would never dream of, we wouldn't even talk to our dog sometimes the way we, we, we chastise ourselves. Not in the UK, no way. They call no. the RACPA for you. No, 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 about that. You don't <laughs> talk to your dog like that. <laughs> you would be behind bars for abuse, for even thinking those things, you know? So let's alone, so for me, it was mindfulness. And everybody kept saying, it's a practice. It's a practice. Mm. Getting into it. And, and honestly, what you said about uh, imposter syndrome, if Michelle Obama can feel imposter syndrome, Amen. then what mm -hmm. about us? You know, yeah. this is something that's pervasive, all of us. Yeah. It may come from left field. It may, you know, she's a professor of law. The lady actually did a Muted. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry about that. Um, yeah, anyway, if Michelle Obama can feel that, that somebody's going to put their hand on your shoulder and say, gotcha. Uh, Throughout my life, that is how mm. I feel. Somebody's going to say, I know who you really are. You've been out there yeah. fooling everybody, but uh, gotcha. And it was that clutch on, you know, that I always feared. But with mindfulness, that fear has disappeared, mm. has literally disappeared. Beautiful, beautiful. I can beautiful. face my, because I can face myself and mm. accept myself, this container that has all these emotions, sensations, likes, dislikes, play, whatever is there, I accept it. That's me. 
beautiful and i'm not comparing that. myself with anybody so and there you go you slay in your own lane mm. and the lane you don't slay in i pay someone to do it for me because that's not my lane so i know what i'm great at i don't do admin i hate pay for admin <laughs> i don't do excel it doesn't make me excel you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah so you pay you just you have know, to exhale <laughs> exhale you know <laughs> But just as I'm listening to you, Elizabeth, I was thinking about, you know, you speaking about breath at the moment. I'm very much into polyvagal theory, yes. which is about looking at the nervous Tra system. Yeah, and trauma. You, you look at trauma, you know that you've got fight, flight, but you've also got shutdown. And, you know, so, so these are things that aren't always in traditional, you know, when you go to your doctors, they're kind of like, they're not up to speed with current developments. Even now, I've just given a client the book to read over the new year be, between now and Christmas because I know I ain't going to get around to it. And yes, it's Stephen There you go. Is yeah. Deb, da oh, Deb Dana. Yeah, yeah Deb oh, right. Dana. You know, because okay. people, people, if people can make sense of, for mm. example, breath, you know, I, w I watched someone here last week have a panic attack. I, guess, I, guess, I, I said to them, you're going to do it to yourself again. And it happened right here because they stop breathing. You, you stop breathing, breath is your life. Mm -hmm. No breath, no life, simple Simon stuff, right? So how can you begin to teach people the true reality is what, pe what they call in mental health problems is actually trauma. And yeah. what we're looking at is people's trauma responses. Mm -hmm. Go to, you know, mainstream is not helping people and there's political reasons for that. If we read the body keeps the score, it, it goes into kind of, Remember, our DSM-5 is, is funded by the American drug companies. DSM-5 is funded by them. Naturally, they would have a vested interest in creating all these diagnoses because they'll also find the treatment. And insurance companies don't necessarily want to pay for trauma treatment because trauma treatment is not always necessarily tablets. It's not always quick fix. You have mm -hmm. to help people to be able to regulate their nervous system which is what Elizabeth has been able to do through her breath work. She's mm -hmm. regulating her own system through breath. And, you know, I'm just passionate about helping whatever it is that helps people to find their way. I'll read, I'll purchase, I'll buy whatever it is, because I'm just fascinated mm -hmm. because the potential of the organism, you know, when we stop worrying about trying to develop big dick Derek's potential. Sorry, Elizabeth, but you know, sometimes I just have to say it like this, right? When we give up trying to nurture his potential and we begin to readjust and align to our genius within, ooh, I have no idea what will become of the people that come to my door because when they begin to honor that potential, mm. I've had two texts today from clients who yeah. share their good news with me and I'm so glad they do because yeah. it lights my world up. And it's like, yeah. Keith, this has just happened. One client just got a massive big job. Never thought she could do it. God bless her spirit. I got goosebumps all over. Another client, a couple of months ago, tried to commit the ultimate act of self-harm, which is the ultimate act against the organism that is designed to heal itself. You try to poke yourself in the eye, your body going to try and protect yourself from yourself. The, you mm. imagine the genius of the organism that mm. it actually self-heals. As great as this technology is, this cannot self-heal. And I dropped it, so I've got to go and get another screen again, right? It can't self-heal. We are designed to heal ourselves. Mm -hmm. And and to see that thou, that person who was at that, that point where they were going to take their life is now like key. And my boss wants you to see me every month because they want me, they want, they've promoted me again. They want me to coach me. It's, I, it's, it never ceases to amaze me. Never a dull day. Mm. incredible amazing yeah, yeah. i really really appreciate this and unfortunately we are coming close to time and i'd love for people to to know your details keely um yes. so thank you guys you know do your bread work and um we're coming close to holidays so take care of your mental health and reach out to people like um keely she's amazing um so i'll just make you have you got your uh, powerpoint ready okay. Oh God, no! If my no, assistant, okay. my assistant would have done that for me, um, okay, it's that's a okay. weekend. So, and she has to have a break. Basically, no, that's okay. Wanna, don't worry. Maybe you can email it out, but you can find yeah. me at keyforchange.com. Go to keyforchange.com, and that will link you to all my other mm -hmm. 
click click booms click click booms give awesome. me a like and give me a subscribe all right as well the number i've got four. both oh you got both ah clever <laughs> I was told awesome. to buy both. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. This has been so incredible and interesting. And I um, told you, you I could really talk for ages. Your time. Now. I said to you, you, you sure did. You didn't do some points, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you all a really, really great holiday and um, thank you for showing up and really appreciate everything you're doing for humanity and your spirit mm -hmm. is beautiful. So yes, yes. thank you all. Thank, thank you, Elizabeth, thank as well. You. Thank you, Mansarta, for bringing us thank together. Oh. Yeah, oh. That's space. So nice. Really kind and generous. <laughs> <You too. laughs> Bye, Bye everyone. Happy thank you, holiday. Kitty. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome, Tanya. I saw you laughing. I saw you laughing. <laughs> oh, you're fantastic. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Amazing. Incredible. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.